So it is time for the 80 minute MBA. That means it is time to start the clock. He used to wait till we were on stage. Yeah, so we're gonna have one minute late. We've lost five seconds already. Do we get those five seconds back? Uh, thank you, Brendan, for that introduction. Uh, happy Happiness Day, as uh, Brendan said. You also said we've been doing this for a few years, so John and I are hoping that that isn't why we're in this particular venue, and that no would, nobody in Brendan's outfit said that event belongs in a museum. <laughs> Although we are in a museum, it's a fantastic venue. Um, and also, as he said, it goes, we can't guarantee to double your salary, but we do know that people who get an MBA tend to earn a bit more. Hands up who's already got an MBA, or who's thinking about doing an MBA. Okay, so the first thing to say is that we're pro-MBA. We had a couple of letters from various business schools when our book came out when we started presenting to say how dare you try and distill what we're doing into 80 minutes. It takes two years and £25,000 uh, in order to do it, but we're pro-MBA, we think it's very good. All we're trying to do is distill down what we think are kind of the takeaway messages from it and to do it much more quickly and quite a bit more cheaply. So try not to think of us as the guys who paid 250 quid. Is that what it was? 200 quid? Have I really revealed something? Well, whatever you paid, <laughs> try not to think of us as the people you paid that amount for and instead think of us as the guys that saved you 25,000, okay? That's the, that's the number I want you in, in your mind is going to listen to us uh, today. Uh, so we've written a book, we've been doing this for a while as we say, and uh, you can't write a book uh, without some sort of diagram. You need a sort of triangle, a vortex, some sort of uh, three-dimensional thing which explains everything. So, uh, and you also need a motto. So first of all, our motto, any Latin scholars in the room? Oh my God. Can you, any, can you tell us what this roughly is? Faster is better. Thank you very much. Faster is better. We got it right. It's the first time actually someone's been able to actually test us on it. Faster is better. That's the motto. We think that actually you can get stuff done pretty quickly, get some takeaway messages uh, done pretty fast. So to hold us to account, you can see the clock is already ticking. You don't, we're not going to overrun because you'll be able to tell if we're overrunning. We guarantee to finish on time. Uh, here's our little graph, our vortex, our tornado. What is it? Tornado. tornado. A tornado. So this is what we're going to go through. These are the modules of your MBA course today. It'll also be various, uh, there's foreign language modules, there's a uh, bit of neuromarketing, there's all other stuff too, but the main ones are sustainability. We start with sustainability, we make no apology for that, um, and we'll say why in a moment. We then have a whole section on leadership, as you'd expect, those who've done MBAs will know there's a lot on leadership, and then we have what we call the three C's. We're going to do culture, organisational culture, cash, finance and accounting, and then we're going to finish with conversation, or what would previously have been called marketing, probably, uh, in your organisation. So we're going to do all that, we're going to do that in the next 80 minutes, and then at the end of that, as you say, you get a certificate, which we're willing to sign for you to put on your wall and tell your boss about. So, uh, first of all, first module, sustainability, and over to Dr. Nell. Thank you. you um, so who recognises who this is? No. Who, another offer? Stuart Rose, yeah. former, um, former Chief Executive and Chair of Marks and Spencers. Um, I'll come to you in a minute. So why sustainability? Um, well, we make a very strong pitch when, in terms of the 80-minute MBA um, that, first of all, success for your businesses and for the economy brought at the cost of our fragile planet is not success. And also, we had a very strong instinct when we started this that actually sustainability is an issue. Whatever the issues around the science, which we're going to talk about, was going to rise to the top of the business agenda and the political agenda. So we, can, we will continue to predict, as we did over the last few years, that if you look at MBA courses in five to ten years' time, they will be giving more um, time to this, not less. Um, and so why, and, and, so, and we'll tell you why. And let's also then talk about how has this risen up the corporate agenda. Let's chart a bit of history. And you can see already, in the time that we've been doing this, that I think we were right to make the prediction and how it's changed in corporate life. So this is the face of, if you like, eco-activism in our corporate world, circa 2007. Why is Stuart Rose here? Because in 2007, M&S made a commitment to become carbon neutral. They were the first mainstream recognisable brand on our high streets who said, we're going to become carbon neutral. And they set 180 targets that they were going to hit. Last time I looked, in 2012, they'd hit 138 out of 150. Um, can I say that, that, that the fact that they hadn't hit all of them is not the reason for their poor, profitab poor profitability performance? Um, and the general um, sell view, I think, in terms of the investor community. I've done a lot of research on Mark and Spencer's. I've come to a view. I think it's the Blue Harbour range for men, um, any of you who've been inside. Um, for the men in the audience, I have some bad news for you. If your wife is still buying you M&S, she doesn't love you. Um, the, 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 the Prada and the Paul Smith is going to the true object of her affection, so I hate to break up marriages early in the morning, but have a think about that. So this is the face of corporate activism, 2007. Um, you can see how much things changed if we get to the face of corporate activism in 2014. Now, I wouldn't expect you to know who this is, although some of you take a keen interest in green activism and... She was named one of the most um, uh, powerful 
30 under 30. This is Tasmin Osmond, who was a well-known activist around environmental and sustainability issues. She's now the camp global campaigns manager for Lush, the cosmetics company. You know that company that um, comedians make jokes about that you get assaulted by this lavender wave when you walk down shopping malls now. You know, there, are many, there are many kinds of hazards to going to a shopping mall. One is that you'll get overwaved by a lavender wave from a Lush store mm. if they've left the door open. Mm. Well, they don't have a marketing manager anymore. They have a global campaigns manager. And since she's been there, Tasmin has been very aggressive in pushing a whole range of campaigns and also quite political. So Lush are mounting campaigns against fracking. Um, they're put, putting a whole lot of money into some very keen environmental campaigns. So, of course, that begs the question... Why has this risen up the corporate agenda? Why do we see that changing face of eco-activism? And Richard's going to talk to us about the science. So I'm not, I'm not a scientist, but we have to have a little bit of science here because one of the reasons I think that the debate about sustainability has changed is that the space for denial about what's happening around climate change has basically disappeared now. Um, you can't look at the evidence credibly and think there isn't something quite important going on. So here's, uh, here's some science. Um, this is uh, since the middle of the 19th century what's been happening to average temperature, sea level uh, and uh, snow level. And these are the sorts of things that climate scientists will show you to say that things are happening. Things are happening around uh, sea level changes. Things are happening around global average temperature and so on. And we think that might be something to do with carbon. Now, the sceptics will say these things move around quite a lot of the time. And in fact, it's even the case that the amount of carbon in the atmosphere changes as well. So the sceptics will sometimes say, yeah, but carbon kind of always changes. So what you need to do is take a longer run of what's happening to carbon. This tells you, this goes back 2,000 years, because we can use carbon dating to go back and see what's happening. Um, to see what's happening with the emissions of carbon dioxide, methane, and carbon nitrous oxide. Now, as I said, I'm not a climatologist. I don't really know this science very well, but I think something different's happening and that something changed, right? That's my takeaway from this graph is that it's real. Uh, and I think enough business leaders are now starting to realise that. So it may have dipped below the kind of radar during the recession and it's still low when you kind of do surveys and so on. But the question of sustainability and the impact of climate change, as well as the impact of laws and regulations to try and mitigate climate change, are coming your way, almost regardless of what kind of business you are. Um, so the science has changed. But in order to understand all of this, you need a bit more statistics. John's like a proper academic. He's like a proper doctor. Um, he's taught, he knows about numbers, so he's doing <laughs> statistics. So this is the statistics module. You so, do about one minute. Don't who, you? So who loves numbers in the audience? Who does the stats? Great. It's always about 3% in an audience, we find. Less than 5 um, The reason why we do this, by the way, this is a very important point. We're very pro being um, numerate liter in, in, in organisations. Your staff should understand your financial results. They should care about the numbers. They should get the numbers. And you might think we're pushing you a line on sustainability. So one of the things you need to do is understand, if you were trying to be a sceptic and an informed sceptic or an informed consumer of this, where would you go? And what are the two key statistical concepts you'd need to know? The first is statistical significance. Um, this is, some of this will be dredging up memories from those dingy classrooms a um, long time ago. Um, so if I was to say to you that... Um, training and productivity are related. You know, there is a statistically significant relationship between them in your well-run organisations. We'd be saying that there's a statistically significant relationship between those two variables, i.e. variations in one is being caused by variations in the other. Um, and what statisticians are brilliant at is giving numerical expression to these very important real-life relationships. And this is the magic number. P is less than 0.05. Because if we were examining the statistical significance and the relationship between those two variables... If that it appears less than 0.05, there's a less than 5% chance that they're due to luck. You know, the, the relationship is due to luck. In other words, the interrelationship we're seeing is due to luck or chance. Or if you like, there's a 95% confidence rating um, that one is statistically significantly related to the other. But for the HR directors, who's from HR here? Yeah, so the HR directors, of course, you should be very friendly with the statisticians in your business. Because your holy grail um, to pitch up to your boards to get more money for your department is to prove not just that they're statistically related significantly, but that actually there's a causal relationship. So you want to say that increases in your training budget are improving productivity. You want to so, but of course the trouble with life is it's complicated. Just because two variables are statistically significantly related. So in Richard's previous point, the fact that we do know that there's an increase in CO2 in gases, the key thing is, and there is a statistically significant relationship with aspects of global warming, is one causing the other. That's where the debate lies. That's where the there is a debate to be had. And the trouble with life is you get all these pesky intervening variables. So the trouble with organisations is they might be even more productive because they have fantastic leadership, because they're really real one, we're really well run, they've got great culture, they put together their people in fantastic teams, things that could all impact on productivity other than just training. Um, so one of the things that we're trying to do is work out what these intervening variables are. And one of the key advantages of this, apart from being able to be good consumers of uh, global warming, 
um, and its uh, advocates is if you now read the Metro or any other rag or any other newspaper, this is partly to warn you against very bad PR-led surveys that dominate our cheap um, news sheets that you read on the underground. This is a headline from a real paper, which is bottled water linked to healthier babies. Now, just ponder that for a minute. Now, armed with your new insights um, around uh, correlation and causation, i.e. correlation doesn't equal causation, just because two variables may be related doesn't mean they're causing the other, you only have to think for a moment about what might be the characteristics of a family that buy bottled water. Perhaps they live in a more affluent area. Perhaps they're better able to food, clothe, and culturally equip their children for the travails ahead. Um, so, of course, affluence is the intervening variable. And you can see the ludicrousness of that previous statement, because if it was a true causal relationship, we'd just as likely find that families with cappuccino makers um, have healthy babies. Um, but by the way, there's a story like that in your metro today, tomorrow, um, and over the weekend as you um, read this. So, so statistics matter, and uh, please make your people numerate. So, back to sustainability. One of our key arguments is, of course, therefore, you should go and look at the evidence if you care about these things, and we'd encourage leaders to do so. But the most noticeable thing, and it's been particularly over the last two years, is that events are running ahead of the science. So there's still a debate to be had about correlation and causation around the evidence. But what's really changed is that we're seeing extreme weather events. And one thing that is less contested is that there seems to be something quite powerful going on causally, that global warming is increasing the frequency and severity of weather events. And there's a much stronger consensus about that to a degree than there is, in some respect, about the linkages between us as making man-made contribution to CO2 and global warming. This is a heat map of North America in 2012, which they had its hottest year ever. Um, this is my favourite iconic picture of the global warming movement. Do you know what, who, I don't know if you recognise this, this is the Holmes family. Mm. Um, there was a whole set of forest fires across South Australia and Tasmania. These guys lived in Tasmania. This is the grandmother. Here are the four children. Um, grandfather, sorry, five. Grandfather obviously taking the picture. And the only place that they could survive as their house burned down was the two feet of oxygen at the end of their pier in the water. The other thing that I like about this picture is it does make you ponder the modern condition. Yeah. Um, you know, the, remember there's a grandfather. You're nearly dying. His reaction She's was... She's holding the kid. Oh, truth, Madge. I've never seen the kids <laughs> yeah, look so right. scared. <laughs> Can you hold the kids I must, for a minute? I must take a picture. Could you get the one on the right to smile? Um, I don't know about you. That I find that slightly strange. Um, but anyway, the Holmes family in Tasmania... Um, here are, here's the Somerset levels, bang up to date. Houses in summer that, set, that look more like ships um, than places you might wish to live. And Hurricane Sande from space. And this, I think, was a big moment in particular because we knew a tipping point had happened. So, so our instinct was, whatever the evidence, this agenda is going to rise up the corporate and political agenda, is after Hurricane Sande and what it did to the east coast of America, Bloomberg, the Bible of business, um, in terms of magazines in the US, had this colour. Um, it's global warming stupid. Now, that's despite the fact that... This is an interesting thing about politics and the media. That's despite the fact that you could continue to argue the scientific debate has been hopping up and statistical debate about global warming not cooling down. Um, interestingly, of course, this shift in perception hasn't necessarily meant that politicians um, of all colours and persuasions internationally are lining up in the same place around concerted action. Any policy wonks here? Anybody read the budget carefully? <laughs> And so there's also an interesting budget story yesterday that um, there was a slight flip-flop from Osborne because he'd set a, a carbon price floor some two years ago and he's frozen it. So there seemed to be, you could argue, some retreat um, from some of the commitment to regulating greenhouse gases. So um, that's the case. Things have moved. And um, Richard's going to tell you about, if you buy that, what are the real impacts? So a further empirical case for why sustainability matters. So why do we care about this, right? Uh, you might care about it as a citizen, you might care about it as a parent, as a consumer. And by the way, the cappuccino machine thing might, and healthier kids might be true. I've got a cappuccino machine, I've got three kids. And I think they are healthier because if you get good coffee, you're less likely to start kind of like yelling at them, <laughs> hitting them. Because you know, unless you get a good cup of coffee in the morning, parenting is impossible. But anyway, um, so why might you care? Well, I think there's three reasons. We're going to quickly go through three reasons why a business might care. Uh, about uh, climate change for those other reasons, for com purely commercial. Firstly, the climate changing itself might affect your business, just the physical effects of it. So uh, co the current issue of the Harvard Business Review, the front cover is building resilience, and it's all about running your company in a heating world. Uh, there's four articles in there, um, and this idea of resilience, resilient cities, resilient companies, is essentially about recognising that, and this is a depressing finding in a way, that, that climate change is happening, it's going to happen, We've kind of passed some various tipping points. Of course, we need to do more to try and stop it, but you also need to get ready. So actually get physically ready. Secondly, that the law might change around it. 
uh, the regulation, despite what David Cameron said, uh, and thirdly, because uh, some people's views about this, consumers and employees' views might change. So first of all, climate, business impact. Who cares about the rising sea level? Um, which we kind of looked at. Well, I'll tell you who cares about it. There's a few. One, if you run a hotel chain where 80% of your property is beachfront property in some of the most fragile parts of the world. So some of the world's biggest hotel companies take climate change very seriously indeed because you have fabulously expensive real estate in some of those fragile places in the world. So you care about it. That's a very obvious example. But if you're a chocolate manufacturer, where do you get your cocoa from? You get it, you get it from parts of Africa. You won't be able to grow cocoa in those places in the next 15 years. You're going to have to grow it somewhere else. And so thinking that far ahead as to where, where is climate change going to affect your business? In your supply chain, if it's affecting you uh, consciously or deliberately, um, it might affect you kind of further down your supply chain. Another example, of a fun one I like is that, um, who likes champagne? Hands up who likes the odd glass of champagne? Okay, most of us. As you'll know, in order to get champagne, you need exactly the right climate and exactly the right rock. So it's kind of chalk, but I'm not an expert, chalk-based soil. Blah, blah. Anyway, I love this stuff, right? But you need kind of chalk soil or something particular kind of climate and a particular kind of soil on a particular kind of rock, which you find in the Champagne region of France, very heavily regulated. If climate change happens, that region will no longer be the best place to grow champagne. So some of the biggest champagne companies in France have recently been coming over to the UK and looking at land and considering buying huge parcels of land in the UK for future champagne production, because that will become the new place. They need the same chalk. The climate of the future is going to be in Kent, so the place that you're going to be able to grow what we currently call champagne is going to be Kent. So 25 years from now, we're going to be toasting each other with a glass of Gillingham. <laughs> so get used to it now, right? You heard it here first. They are buying land or about to buy land in Kent uh, in order to kind of grow champagne. So those are kind of various examples. Think about your supply chain. Second, what's going to happen around the law? So carbon price, regulation. Uh, as John said, the political will around this is, is not always there, but there's going to be movement. Carbon's going to get more expensive, one way or another whether it's your regulation, capital trade, it's going to get more expensive. So how much carbon have you got in your portfolio? And this is uh, old data, this is pre-recession, but all the reason this is take an energy company and take a financial services company and say, what's their turnover? Roughly similar turnovers on the left-hand side. And then what's their carbon footprint? And we only know this because they voluntarily declare it at the moment. So just in a sense of get a sense of how much carbon are you producing for how much turnover. And obviously when banks and so on decide that they're going to go green and go paperless or whatever, it's dead easy for them to go green because they haven't got any carbon anyway. But if you're an energy company or a transport company, you rely on trucks, you're, uh, you're producing lots of energy, manufacturing, then you bet if the cost of carbon goes up, your business model is going to have to change as well. So just the sheer cost of it or the regulatory impact of carbon is the second reason the law. And then the third is kind of the changes in how people feel about it and their ethical behaviour. Now, it's very hard to get a handle on this, whether people always say that they wanted to buy green, but they don't always then do it, so there's a kind of tension there. But nonetheless, it looks like employees and consumers do start to care a bit more about this. And the kind of younger generations in particular, the millennials, they seem to care about it a bit more in terms of who they work for, where, who they buy from. This is um, a protest against TXU, an American uh, energy company who wanted to build um, a coal-fired power stations in Texas, and the campaign was to make them carbon capture. So they actually captured the carbon that was produced by it. And interestingly, what they did was they went after TXU, but they also went after the people financing it. They went after HSBC, they went after the financers of it. They did mass die-ins in the lobbies of HSBC and so on. So they went for the money. The money then started drying up, and TXU had to reverse and agree to build the coal-fired uh, power stations with carbon capture. Now, that's one example. There are lots of examples where it hasn't worked, but nonetheless, this pressure from consumers, employees, generally, like, is likely to grow. How fast it'll grow, we don't know, but it's likely to be the case that in 20 years' time, if you're still wanting to hire the best and get people to buy your products, then actually thinking harder about the environment is likely to be important. Right, first section, congratulations. You've finished the first section of the 80-minute MBA on sustainability. Now, all MBA courses will have a big section on uh, leadership. The problem with this is we have a little timer thing here just to reveal, lift the time here to tell us what, at what stage we're supposed to get to each bit, which is fine. But since we started doing this, John and I, both our eyesight started going. <laughs> so if I, if I start doing this at one point, like, what time is it? Oh, OK, fine. Yeah, we're fine. Um, leadership would probably take up, I don't know, those who did an MBA. How, how much of your MBA course was on leadership, would you say? What proportion of it was on leadership? Quarter. Hmm? Quarter. Quarter, yeah. That's a heck of a lot, right? Because one of the reasons you go on an MBA course is you want to come through today. So it's probably about a quarter of our it course is, as well, isn't it? So, you know, we're, we're matching it exactly. So we're going to get a full 15, 20 minutes uh, on leadership. <laughs> Frankly, we think that's all you need, but you can judge at the end of this. 
So here's the bad news. While you're here today, um, five books will be published on leadership. On average, every day, five books on leadership. So if you're really keen, you've got a lot of catching up to do um, when you get home, or you could just get a smaller book, which summarises it in, in 80 minutes. Um, so that's the bad news. There's quite, quite a lot of books out there on leadership. You see them in airports in particular, and, and so on. Um, the good news is that they're almost entirely crap. So you can ignore almost all of them, uh, and it will have no impact whatsoever on, on your leadership. It's just churning out. I always be very careful at this point. I always check who Brendan's got speaking next uh, kind of events, because you can get into trouble by accidentally going for someone who's about to speak at one of Brendan's. All of the people Brendan gets are good, just to be clear. Um, but there's a lot of rubbish out there, right? So ignore them. How, how do you ignore them? Well, one of the things you notice is that quite a lot, it's the something leadership or the something leader, right? There's always a prefix. Um, you will get ridiculous things like the Winnie the Pooh. What can you learn from Winnie the Pooh? Um, there's one about, uh, my, one of my favourites was, what can we learn from seals about leadership? No, what seals can teach you about leadership? That did jump off the shelves to me, actually. Because I think, <laughs> I really want to know. Because they like, catch fish, jump off, catch another fish. Always stay on the ice flow with the... I don't know, how, how, what are they going to do with this? And it turns out it was seals as in US Navy seals. <laughs> um, honestly, I don't think it was much more useful. Um, you get this kind of US Navy seal commander. And he's kind of like, if, if you want someone to go up a cliff and take out an, an Al-Qaeda hideaway, great. But honestly, the attempts to show how grappling your way up a cliff and fighting your way through a gun and, uh, and how that's really just like the quarterly management meeting just doesn't work. So, um, but they'd always have something, a word in front of them. It's a something, lead, something leadership, right? These are all real titles I'm going I'm to put in front of you now. Um, and I want you to apply, I think it was George Orwell said, you always have to think whether the opposite statement means, me, is meaningful. When someone says something, could you realistically hold the opposite view? Or does saying the opposite really mean anything? Because if saying the opposite doesn't mean anything, you haven't said anything, right? So think about some of these. So you have authentic leadership. Actually, this is one of the, maybe it's one of the slightly better ones, I'm not sure. But anyway, it, authentically, as opposed to inauthentic leadership, right? As opposed to lying your way through leadership. Actually, I'm going to argue for that in a moment. But authentic leadership is one. Primal leadership. What the heck is that about? As opposed to what? Secondary leadership? This is a really big one. Very, very buzz. If you've done an MBA recently, you'll be all about resonance. Um, you need to be a resonant leader. Okay? Got it? As opposed to what? Like a dissonant leader? Uh, what's the opposite of resonance? What does it mean? Do you sound nice? Living. <laughs> As opposed to corpsing. Leadership. Uh, well, we've all experienced that. Uh, in our lives. You know what I mean? Okay, so be alive. Great, that's really helpful. Thank you. Um, courageous leadership as opposed to scared, stiff leadership, which is what most of us experience. Tribal leadership, I have no idea. Spiritual leadership as opposed to atheist leadership. Uh, servant leadership. Tony Blair came in. I actually worked for the first Blair government saying, we are the servants now. Do you remember that? 1997. We are the servants now. Servants, honestly. Maybe my particular favourite. <laughs> Liquid leadership. Are you a liquid leader? Are you? Really? As opposed to a solid leader? Or a gaseous leader? <laughs> God forbid. What is going on here? Anyone know who this is? No. No one knows who this is. It's a shame. It's always a source of great sadness to John and I because this is our hero. This man is our hero. His name is Darwin E. Smith, who was chief executive of Kimberly Clark from 1971 to... 1991. Arguably one of the most successful chief executives in modern corporate history. The fact you haven't heard of him is quite important um, because it was one of the reasons he was so successful was he was not that interested in being known about. So um, this is from one of the very good books, which I'm glad to say is still on sale. Even in airports, it was on sale in DC yesterday when I flew out. Good to great. Right? If you're going to read one book on business and leadership, make it the 80-minute MBA. If you feel you have to read another book, Read Jim Collins, good to great. And the one reason we like about it is because he set out to prove that leaders didn't matter. His own evidence, rigorously applied, told him that leaders really mattered. So he found the opposite of what he was looking for, tested it, and tested it again. That's a much, much more important finding than someone who said, oh no, I bet resonance is important. So I'll make up a measure of resonance, go out and measure it, and guess what? It'll be really important. And I'll write a book called Resonant Leadership. Are you resonating yet? Then I can speak about it, make a fortune. That's where we went, that's where we went wrong. It is. Um, so, before Darwin Smith, this is Kimberly Clark's um, market cap against the general market. And he takes over. 
This is Kimberly Clark's market cap against general market. Again, we're not experts. Looks like he's doing something right, or something happened to Kimberly Clark. Maybe it's not causal, maybe it's correlation, maybe there's something else going on. Jim Collins has a look. Turns out it is a lot to do with Darwin E. Smith. And the reason you do that is because you look at other companies in the Good to Great studies, 13 companies here, that compared to other companies in the same markets did unbelievably well after these transition points. And we discovered what appear to be these transition points. What's going on here? Discovered it was a change of leadership. So whether you like it or not, and he didn't like it to start with, Collins didn't like it to start with, leaders really make a difference to the performance of a business. Right? So leadership does matter, and MBA courses are right to look at leadership. So what's going on? Well, as we don't have much time, what we're going to do is give you, the first service is give you a whole bunch of things to forget about, right? So forget about some of the following things. If you're interested in being a good leader, forget about these. Forget about charisma. For two reasons. One, it doesn't matter. Char charismatic leaders are not more successful leaders. There is no evidence that charisma is in any way associated with more successful leadership. Secondly, you can't learn it or get it anyway, right? It's not something you can go on a course, become charismatic, right? So forget about it. It just makes us all feel bad. Because you just read these books and these people say, look how charismatic I am. If you're only you were as charismatic as me, you'd be rich like me. And you read it in the airport and go, this is really crap. Right, so forget about it. balance, forget about balance. Don't try and be balanced. In HR, there's this whole thing, a balance scorecard in HR. Ugh. Uh, it's basically, you know, you've got to be good at, good at this, good at this, good at, this, good at everything. Right, everybody's rubbish at lots of various things. Uh, the key is recognize that, get someone else to do that, and focus on the stuff you're good at. Stop trying to balance yourself. The greatest leaders are fundamentally unbalanced, sometimes unhinged. But the point is, we all have strengths and weaknesses, right? Don't try and get balanced. Don't, don't spend your entire time trying to work on your weaknesses, right? Because you won't get much out of it. Focus on your strengths and subcontract the other stuff. Coaching. Don't have much time to go into this. Apologies to any coaches in the room or people who like coaching. Our view about coaching is that it's a fantastic way of getting your company to pay for your therapy. Brilliant. Uh, and we're pro-therapy, but as a business, as a leadership tool, the idea of coaching leadership, complete contradiction in terms. Don't have more time, sorry. Um, strategy. Maybe a bit more controversial. MBA courses spend a lot of time on strategy. We're basically suggesting strategy is not that important to leadership. Probably needs a bit of justification. John Nell. Um, so, the, I, we're going to suggest to you it's not that strategy isn't important, but the best definition of strategy I've ever heard is Fife and Sutton, a couple of American academics. He said, if your organisation is a sheet of paper and it's got a set of iron filings on the top, strategy is like a magnet, and it lines up all the iron filings and takes them under. It's core strategy is important, but there's a sort of dirty secret about strategy in a lot of organisations, which is that a lot of top teams, a lot of MBA um, graduates, because they're good at it after they've done MBA course, start to think it's a silver bullet delusion. If we can just get our strategy better, let's do a bit more time, let's go and polish it a bit more. Um, think about it a bit more, we'll outperform the competition. Um, and the real truth um, is that a good enough strategy, brilliantly executed, often means that you'll outperform your competitors. You might have a fantastic strategy and screw up an execution. Here's a great quote from Richard Koryevich, former CEO of Wells Fargo. Fargo. You can read it yourself. There's an apocryphal story that one of the major professional service firms in this country got hold of, I'm not sure whether it's true or not, um, yes. the competitive strategy of one of their competitors. Um, they operated in similar markets, with similar market conditions. The very bright people in the two firms, unsurprisingly, had come up with remarkably similar strategies. What's probably going to make a difference between them is their ability to execute. So key message, execution is everything. If you're not focusing on your execution as a business, you'll fall over. And there's a big problem, actually, in a lot of organisations, is when you get that split um, between understanding um, what you're trying to do and your ability to deliver it. And look, Rich and I have been strategy consultants. Um, it's tough at the top. You know, we've found that strategy days normally involve breaks at country, you know, star hotels, five stars, pools, mm -hmm. spas. It's good to get away time away from the family, mm -hmm. spend time with your colleagues. Um, so strategy, of course, enjoy those days. But as long as when you get back to the office, you remember that your real job is execution. Because strategy without that means you won't succeed. Richard. Very good. Okay, so how are you? We're going to do some things you do need to know as a leader. Again, apologies, have to do it pretty quickly. Um, Great leaders seem to know the following. Again, we're leaning heavily on Collins here. They know where the organisation's going. As the famous Frenchman, Ledru Rollin, 19th century, said, there go my people, I must find out where they're going so that I can lead them. Right? We've all had leaders like that. Right? They're path dependent. They're not actually saying, where are you going? Um, our hero, Darwin Smith, when he took over Kimberly Clark, said we're going to sell the paper mill in Kimberley. This is a paper company called Kimberly Clark. And we're going to do that within five years. We need to get out, we need to get into nappies, we need to get into tissues. Anyone who's used the toilets here, right, good chance of using Kimberly Clark products all the time. But got out of paper, into paper products, because he saw the way it was coming, and so we have got to move. Uh, very clear direction, we are moving into paper products and out of paper. Sell the mill in Kimberley. Quite a big move for him. Um, 
how people feel. Now, again, you want to overdo the kind of emotional side of workplaces, but it's quite clear that leaders, even if they themselves uh, are not spectacularly kind of emoting kinds of people, they do have a sense of what's happening. I quite often have spies in the organisation, people who just tell them what's the mood of the organisation. Emotions are important in business. There's a book called The, um, the Change Monster, which is about the emotional roller coaster. Very good book. It kind of recognises that change is emotionally difficult for people and allowing people to kind of go through kind of emotions of fear and anger and so on is a very important part of business. But you need to kind of know not just how people are doing, but in a sense of what's the mood of the place. Hard as a leader to find out. What you need is spies, as I said, at different levels of the organisation. They do know what's going on. I think one of the difficult things that's happened in business recently is the split between management and leadership. Right? The whole thing was leaders know where we're going. Leaders are visionary, etc. Managers do the really boring stuff, right? So management becomes boring, leadership becomes exciting, everyone wants to be a leader. But actually that split doesn't really work in practice. In practice, good leaders are also pretty good managers in the sense they do know what's going on. They have data dashboards, they stay on top of the figures. There's no coincidence that Darwin Smith was the chief financial officer of the organisation. He kept getting daily reports. What's happening? What's happening with that factory? What's the flows? Where's the sales? And so on. So the idea that becoming a great leader means you can somehow leave all the boring management stuff to people less talented or less clever than you is wrong. You have to keep your hands around the organisation as well. So management is part of leadership. You have to know physically what's happening in the organisation. That requires data. It requires you to stay close to the number. It also, and John's mentioned this, build great teams, right? This is clear in the literature that those who do well surround themselves with people who are very successful in and of their own right. Uh, Manfred Kett de Vries, who's in HBR again this, this month, said, um, you can tell a lot from a company about its succession strategy. Is it building up people who could succeed? Uh, in most companies, what the CEO does is to identify the person most likely to replace them and kill the bastard. <laughs> right? Uh, and you kind of know that sense, but actually, so, well, they're a bit threatening, right? Get rid of them, etc. Um, but actually, what you find is the good leaders are the ones who want people to be better than them particularly things that they're not very good at. So I bet you know who that is. I know who that is. In the middle? Yes, Archie Norman. Did pretty well at ASDA. Uh, most people would say good leader. Uh, arguably kind of turned ASDA around. But on his board at the time had some people who also went on to do pretty well. So I always get kind of mixed up. Justin King went on to be CEO of Sainsbury's. Alan Layton went on to be chairman of the Royal Mail. Richard Baker went on to be CEO of Boots. And Andy Hornby was HBOS. Don't talk about that bit. Uh, uh, and then Boots as well. So all went on to be chairman or CEOs of very serious companies in Ireland. They were all on the board at the same time. So that's who he chose to surround himself with. Now, it didn't necessarily succeed to his position, but he didn't surround himself with people who didn't threaten him either. It's a shame they're all men and white, by the way, but nonetheless, the point holds that these were all people who were very talented in their own right. So where the organisation is how people feel, what's going on, how to build great teams, and lastly, who they are, a kind of sense of self-awareness and what you are good at and what you're not good at, right? So Darwin E. Smith, our hero, lousy communicator, terrible communicator, hated speaking, hated things like this, so basically just delegated it. He got someone who, he, he, he got this woman who was a fantastic communicator, she did all the communications, he would stand up and say, right, no, now over to whatever anyone was, and she would do everything. And everyone just around, Darwin just doesn't do that stuff. He just can't, he can't communicate. He's hopeless at it. So he's just got someone else to do it. He knew himself well enough not to try to be something that he wasn't. And that level of self-awareness is pretty important as well. Really about your own strengths and weaknesses. And being cool with someone else being better at you at something because then it means you don't have to worry about it. So if you get all those things right, and that seems to be what Colin suggests, then you're in good shape. Now, that takes time. All of this takes time. And it's possible that one of the things you don't feel you've got a lot of is time. You may be suffering from, it's not our phrase, James Glyke's phrase, you may be suffering from hurry sickness, right? So it's all very well to say you've got all these things. You may actually feel there isn't much. The unforgiving minute isn't giving much, right? You're rushing around. So let's find out whether, you've got, whether you're suffering from hurry sickness. Um, a little poll here. When you uh, brush your teeth in the morning, you're always doing something else at the same time. Hands up. Who's always, when you brush your teeth, you're always doing something else. Looking for your socks, into the radio. Hands up. No shame here. Safe Sorry. place. Always do something else. Right? When you get in the car, the radio is always on or you're getting on the phone. You never drive in silence. Hands up, that's true. You never drive in silence, okay? When you just catch a train or a plane, right? You just get on it, right? With like 30 seconds to spare. You just catch it. Part of you quite likes that. <laughs> Part of you is quite cool with that. Part of you thinks, look at all that time I didn't waste. Yeah? Look at all those losers who are waiting like five minutes. <laughs> Look at me. Hands up who has got a bit of a buzz out of just catching and playing a routine. Oh. Right? You quite, you quite like oh. it. And, it's, and it's, the thing is, it's worth missing the odd one, isn't it? Because <laughs> that sense of time superiority, it's like, look at me, I just slipped in, the door closed right behind me. Wow. Um, when you get into a lift or an elevator, let's call it, an idiot, um, 
you uh, first button you look for is the door close button. That button with the arrows that go in, it kind of closes on Hands up if you do that. You get in the middle, like, where's this going to go? Hands up, okay, fine. The average time people wait now has dropped from four seconds to two seconds before they press that button. Uh, that's happened in the last 20 years. So imagine getting in an elevator, you want to wait, you go, one, two, three. It's unthinkable you'd wait that long, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> last time I checked, only about 50% of those buttons are actually wired up to the elevator at all. Um, it's a placebo. Uh, it is there to make you feel like you're in control. It doesn't actually do anything. Um, it just makes you feel it comes on, the light comes on, so okay, fine, I've saved myself two seconds. Uh, look how important I am. When uh, you, let's say you've gone to your meeting on the 13th floor of this building, right, and you go up, you go in the elevator or lift, and you're going back down again, and you call it to go back down to your next meeting, uh, and you call it, and you press the button, bing, and it lights up, makes a noise, goes red, and you wait. And you wait for a bit. Hands up if you've ever gone back and pressed it again. <laughs> hands up, hands up. That seems to be everybody, okay? Um, and is the, light's, the light's still on when you did that, right? So, hands up if you think that helps. <laughs> we have a special session for you. <laughs> right, because, of course, it doesn't help. <laughs> the lift doesn't work like that. It doesn't think, God, wow, those people on the 13th floor are really busy and important because they've pressed it like four times now, so i better go and get them because that old bloke on the second floor, he's only pressed it once, so he's clearly not very important or busy. So as the lift, i better go to the important people, right? They don't work like that, okay? Um, so once you pressed it once, actually there's nothing we can do really except wait. But the fact that you're kind of going back to kind of pressing it, why? Because you're suffering from sickness, right? Because you just every second, every moment is wasted. And that's the difference between busyness and business. And just take those 10 seconds, take those 15 seconds, and breathe. Think, do something different. Uh, and an idea might come to you in that moment, right? Those rushes, those few seconds that you're trying to save by pressing those buttons. So if nothing else, stop pressing the door closed buttons because they don't work anyway, by and large, and you save yourself two seconds. <laughs> and, and let the elevator or lift come in its own time. Stand <coughs> and breathe and think. But uh, we need a bit of help with that. So John's now gonna lead us through a little session. Um, Richard, thank you. Um, so, part of our message is you need to take time out. Do not get caught up in hurry sickness. You can't be a good leader if you're rushing around. We did a fantastic piece of work with the business, true story, won't name them, um, where the boss was getting some 360 feedback from his employees that he was unapproachable. Um, we went and worked with the boss. Actually, he did say to us, my door is always open. He said it, and he, did, and he was a company. My door is always open. My staff can come and see me any time. This is why you always think about it. Of course, then when we watched him leave his office to walk across the open plan floor to get to the lift, it was like watching Schwarzenegger palm off people with palm hand tablet, clearly far too busy to be approached. So actually how people experience your hurry sickness also has an impact. So what you need to do, both at work and in your life, is take time to reflect. We were very taken by what the Chicago MBA course do. Remember, this is the 80-minute MBA. We're trying to replicate an experience for you. And what they do is about two-thirds of the way through the course, the students arrive um, expecting to get a normal day in the classroom. Um, and they are taken away from campus. Their electronic devices are surgically removed from them. Um, of course, it normally leads to a set of lawsuits from the um, MBA students who are unhappy that they couldn't close a deal. But, and they're then forced to sit in front of water. Um, why water? Because water is an aid to contemplation and reflection. I'm sure you found that in your leisure time. And they're asked to think about where they are on the course. Ah, oh, some motion waves. Um, and actually, one of the feedback they then get at the end of the course of Chicago MBA is that that is an incredibly influential day for the MBA people on that course. That, that chance of being interrupted and then they have to genuinely reflect deeply about where they are, what they're feeling. So remember this is 80 minutes. We can't replicate a whole day in front of water but we can give you this small space of reflection um, which we're going to do. I, I find it helps to shut my eyes. You don't have to follow me. Um, but you know, if you could just now gather yourself and have a short moment. You might want to reflect on what you've heard already or the thing that's most at the forefront of your mind, your 4am moment this morning. So let's have our reflection built in the 80 minutes. That's a whole day on the 80-minute MBA. Okay, so I hope, but I hope you got there. You see, power, being mindful, we could have, a, if we had longer, we could talk about mindfulness. Um, it's power to your brain. Okay, we're now into the um, closing straight. We're halfway through. Um, we're going to look at um, culture, cash, and conversation. Um, culture first. Um, how do you motivate and get the best out of your people? Clearly a key to success for businesses, um, for you as leaders, in terms of inspiring the teams, that you work with, inspiring your customers and your collaborators, is about the culture of your business. Um, so I'm going to start, before um, we talk about how to do it, I'm going to start about why. Why has a debate about motivating people 
become one of the most dominant themes in our businesses over the last 30, 40 years. Um, and I'm going to tell you a number of reasons. The first is human capital itself. You will know this because we're living through it. We're living through a transformation. We're living through the shift to a knowledge economy, increasingly a data-driven economy. But what's true is that we now have a bias on talent and we have a bias on the ability for us, because of our ingenuity, our creativity, to create value. So outside of the large extractive industries, if you look at the, ta the assets of our companies, and there's been fantastic work done on how you measure the tangible and intangible assets of businesses, 85% of the value of most companies now are tied up in their brand and their ideas and their people. So the reason why there's a HR industry, the reason why we've seen waves of debate about the war for talent, how to get the best out of your people, about reward, the science of motivation, it's because actually we contribute more value in organisations than any other factor of production. So that's why. There's a reason why we care about human capital. Um, the second reason why we care about it, of course, therefore, is we're quite difficult to get motivation out of. So you, know, you can hear, when we, when we talk about other factors of production, you never hear about lazy steel rods, do you? But you do hear about lazy, disengaged people. Fascinatingly, because um, I'm a bit geeky, I look at this stuff. Um, big Gallup survey last year, they, are, they argued that only 13% of the global workforce are engaged. That means working with passion. Mm. Um, 30% of them are actively disengaged, mm. which means playing out their unhappiness at work and undermining the achievements of colleagues. I can't imagine you work with anyone like that. <laughs> well, maybe you do. But, but part of your job is, so how do you make, the reason, therefore, is the holy grail here is the commitment dividend. How do you get people to give of their best? That's what we all should be caring about. Or, if you like, discretionary effort. So how do you go the extra mile, do more? And what we've learned increasingly over the last 20, 30 years is that for a long time, organisations focused on individual motivation. You know, actually, let's focus on people's extrinsic and intrinsic rewards. Actually, increasingly, we're discovering that one of the keys to unlocking collaborative effort, to unlocking productivity, to unlocking ideas, is that you need to focus on how people work together. So actually, what really matters inside a business is your social capital. All that social capital is, but it's a lovely phrase, is if you imagine your organisations and all the totality of people and their networks and their relationships with each other, are you doing things that are going to create that social capital. And again, there's really strong evidence that actually organisations um, that have that strong set of bonds mm. and connections between the people that work there will outperform organisations that don't. And that's irrespective of, if you like, the human capital endowments of those staff. So in other words, you could have a less qualified workforce working with less good kit than an equivalent firm. But if you build that connection, if you create those <coughs> magical conditions that deliver discretionary commitment and social capital, you can improve the performance of the organisation, and Richard's going to tell you how you do it. So we're still in culture, and obviously we're going to have to do this relatively quickly again. The way I think about social capital, I love listening to John talk about that, by the way, um, is it's when the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Right? So you might have the most talented parts of it, but actually looking at your organisation, is the whole greater than the sum? And if, if you've got high social capital, people sharing knowledge, sharing ideas, working together, then the whole will be greater than the sum of the parts. How do you do that, though? It's a reason to say that. So I came up with um, there's three things, and uh, my 17-year-old son pointed out I could make a word out of it. Look, C, so it helps to remember it. Uh, why I didn't think of that, I don't know. Here are the three things that matter. I'm going to do each pretty quickly. Solidarity. It's a funny word. Um, the reason why we've chosen solidarity is because it's capturing something which combines two elements, which we call sociability and purpose. So a solidarity is about kind of being together in the pursuit of something else. It's also a Polish trade union from the 1980s, some of you may remember. Um, uh, sociability is this thing, social capital and friendship. So in another poll, people asked uh, about job satisfaction and found that the biggest predictor, correlation it was, of whether or not you had high job satisfaction was your answer to the following question. Do you have a close friend at work? Yes or no? And so actually that kind of friendship network really made a huge difference to job satisfaction. So friends are good at work. You know, social events are good at work. The last thing you cancel is the Christmas party. Uh, you know, you can sack one of your directors before you get rid of the Christmas party because this stuff really matters, these social networks. Um, well, obviously not you, one of someone else. Um, and actually, we do find them. Between a third and a half of people uh, meet most of their friends through work, uh, up to between as many as half of people now in the younger generation are meeting their life partner or their spouse through work. Um, certainly, people are having relationships with people at work. There's great statistics about the proportion of people who are having affairs at work. You know, last time it was like three quarters of people will say they've had an affair with someone in their office. 
Which, first of all, you kind of think, wow, that's quite high. It's a slight difference between men and women, which always disturbs me a little bit, but anyway. <laughs> but it's one something. Um, so maybe the men are over-reporting a little bit or have a different definition of affair, anyway. Uh, but the uh, kind of key question about that is, why do we never work in these places? Three quarters, really? Where have we been? Um, but the second point is, like, purpose, right? It's, just, it's all very well. It's not, you're not running a social club, right? It's not just people to get together and have coffee and you know, talk about who they are, are or having an affair with. What's the point of the organisation? Purpose. What's the purpose of the organisation? In a good organisation, there's a clear line of sight between what I'm doing and what the organisation is for. The apocryphal story of uh, one of the presidents, LBJ, going to NASA and asking someone cleaning the toilet, what is your job? And they said, my job is to help put men on the moon. Toilet cleaner, my job is to help put men on the moon. Now, apocryphal or not, what it captures is a clear line of sight. Everything I'm doing today, I know how that connects to what the organisation as a whole is trying to do, right? It matters to that purpose. Your job as a leader or as a manager is to create that line of sight between the daily activity and the purpose of the organisation. Without purpose, it's not really work. It's not really, and you're not going to get that engagement. Second thing is energy. Gail Reebuck, the chief executive of um, Random House, said after a few years that her, she figured out her job was to just figure out where the organisation needed some energy and inject some energy into that bit of the organisation. Right? Energy is kind of hugely underappreciated business asset. Right? It's not, what is culture, really? Organisational culture, it's the vibe, it's the feel of the place, I think. It's that kind of buzz, right? I don't mean a kind of arm-waving, cocaine fueled city buzz. Like, unless you're in financial services, as I say, but, um, <laughs> or advertising. But, uh, but that kind of sense of purposeful energy, right? You can tell from a team, a conference, an event, a department floor, how does it feel? What's the energy level like in there, right? So as, an, as a leader, you need to think a lot about energy, right? And what are you doing to deplete? or increase energy levels. My mum had this whole thing. She used to say there are drains and radiators in life. The drains suck the energy out of you. The radiators give you energy. Think about that organisationally. What are the things you do in an organisation that, that, that create or deplete energy? On an individual level, it's a kind of, you know, a drain is someone, even if you love them very much, you spend an hour with them, and at the end of an hour, you, you, you've had a drink. You need another drink to recover, right? <laughs> They've sucked all the energy out of you. Um, a radiator is something you spend an hour with, and you've got a bit more of a spring in your step afterwards, right? They've energised you. So, first of all, as a leader, or as a manager, it's a good idea to try and be a radiator, not a drain, right? To think about how you're behaving around the organisation. But also just organisationally, what do you do? What are the activities, the practices that you have um, that may increase or deplete energy? So, some surveys have been done on this. Uh, people were asked, what do we do in our organisation? What are the things that deplete your energy, that bring you down the most, take your energy out of? What do you think the answer was? Give me some guesses. What things do we do in organisations that reduce energy? Expenses is a great answer. <laughs> Any others? Endless meetings. Meetings, yes. Meetings, meetings. That was, that was number one. Meetings, right? Meetings destroy energy. Um, they're designed to destroy energy. That's why they always have coffee and biscuits in them. Um, because the energy that's being sucked out of you by the meeting needs to be put back in as quickly as possible in the form of caffeine and sugar. Um, it's the only way you can survive them. Um, because they are energy destroyers. So don't have meetings. Have shorter meetings. Stand up for meetings. Cut all the meetings. Don't have meetings. Get rid of all the meetings. Meetings are the drains of organisational energy. You need some, but make them quick and make them energetic. Don't settle in, get your coffee, get your biscuit, you know. Um, and think about how you're creating or destroying energy. And the last thing is autonomy, uh, which uh, is, again, a kind of odd phrase, word, but it's something slightly different from just freedom or liberty. So people being in more control of their lives. So the evidence is people have more control of their task, more control of their time, they're more productive. People who work from home do more work at home than they do when they come to the office. It's partly because people come to the office to have coffee and gossip with each other, about, or, or frankly, by the looks of it, to have an affair with somebody, um, uh, or to check their Facebook status, or whatever it is. Um, they are engaged in what uh, Dilbert, you know, the Dilbert cartoons, described as reverse telecommuting, which is that the office has now become the ideal place to pay your bills, check your Facebook status, book your holiday, and thanks to our friend the computer, it looks exactly like work. Uh, no one has any, uh, and, fine, and actually, by the way, that's all fine, good, spend as much time doing that as you want, just come in and do that all day, just make sure you get your work done when you go home, don't care. Uh, if you're only judging someone by their physical presence in the office, for a lot of jobs now, that's a lousy measure of their productivity, really bad, because they could be sitting there checking Facebook all day for eight hours, great, you're here all day. My job as a manager is not done at that point, because they may have done nothing. So physical presence and productivity are becoming increasingly attached. What's the answer to that? Not more aggressive management. Give people more freedom and make sure you know what their performance metrics are. Right? If you don't know whether someone's doing their job and you're therefore managing their time as a result, it's your performance measures that you've got trouble with, not your time management measures. 
You should know whether they're doing their job, not by measuring where they're sitting at a particular moment in time. Um, so for around time, but also around task as well. Uh, can you redesign your job in some way? Um, those, are the, those are the key things. If people feel they've got more freedom and control over their jobs as far as possible. Frontline jobs, anything. Just think, how can I give more people more control over their jobs? A proportion of them won't be able to do it or won't like it, and some of them will abuse it, whether it's time or task. But that small proportion will be massively outweighed by the increase in productivity and engagement you get from the vast majority of people. If you let go a little bit and you give them more autonomy, all the evidence is you will be rewarded by and large with more productivity. And it will make your life easier as well. Pause. Right, congratulations. We are now well through uh, the segments of our ATM MBA. So we've done sustainability, why it matters. We've done leadership, why you as leaders matter. The culture of an organisation, how you create it. And now we're going to move on to cash, finance, accounting, economics, all by John in the next 10 minutes. Thank you. And just to give you a really up-to-date anecdote, which was only yesterday, about autonomy, um, I've been doing some work on the future of customer service. And we've got any IT chief information officers here? Or people who do with technology? No, but uh, yeah. Well, so the other thing is also is that, remember also the fact that we've now got the generation that grown up digital arriving at work. And the interesting thing is that they're often now arriving at work with more sophisticated technology that they have in their home life than they're now encountering in their own organisations. And this movement is called Bring Your Own Device. So one of the really interesting things, if it hasn't hit you already, and back to autonomy. So Richard's completely right. One aspect of autonomy is about task and time. But I think there's another one now, which is about the autonomy of the tools you use to get your job done. And actually, very clear wake-up call to businesses. If you're, if you're welcome, Matt, to a digitally literate, creative 22-year-old, is you can't use that, and you can't use that, and here's our kit. Yeah. And by the way, no, you can't use that social enterprise network tool that allows you to communicate with our customers because our IT doesn't allow it. Oh, and by the way, you can't set up that internal blog because that doesn't abide with our... Um, you're crushing, not only your creativity, you're also ensuring that however good your employee brand you think it is, you're not going to hire anybody good under 25 for the next 10 years. Just a wake-up call if you haven't heard that one. Okay, finance, finance and accounting, but that's why it matters. Think about autonomy, not just around time and, uh, time and task, but also their kit. Of course, it's difficult for the CIO people because you've got legacy IT. So you've got to leverage your old system. You can't turn away from them. But what do you do about that? And it's a big issue, and it's absolutely essential in locking value from customers. So finance and accounting. Now listen, remember it's the 80 Minute MBA. Any accountants here? Listen, we love finance and accounting. Please don't think that I'm only, because I'm only spending three minutes to four minutes on this, that we don't value it. Um, we value it a lot. Um, but actually, um, remember it's the 80 Minute MBA. That's quite a lot of time in the course of a year. Um, look, um, we already, we already established that not many of you love the numbers. Um, but one of the really important messages about financing and accounting is it's not a fad. Um, the basic principles of double entry bookkeeping have been as with us since ancient Rome. Um, it's a really, really good way um, to understand whether a business is we are both, a business is working, whether it's a going concern, and also um, to by the way, in terms of some of the principles I'm going to tell you now, it's about how to manage your personal finances. So I kind of have two messages. So how many of you are comfortable reading a balance sheet? Come on, be honest. Really comfortable. Find your way around it. I would say that's about. 40% of the audience. So this segment is really for the bluffers. You know, for, I mean, it's not for our accountants, friends, and the people that read it, but this is actually for those people that, you know, maybe not immediately get around the balance sheet. If you apply these principles and rules, I guarantee um, that you will be more confident about using financial accounting. And remember what I said earlier, numeracy matters inside businesses and encourage your um, employees to become numerate. So this is what we like to call as the real godfather, Luca Pacchioni, um, who um, was working in Venice, and he was the first person who, in a book format... Um, recorded the basic principles of double entry bookkeeping. Um, and I'm going to give you the four golden rules, and many of them have really stemmed from that. The first is that every transaction must have at least two parts, debits and credits shown left and right. So remember, back to double entry bookkeeping, fundamental of accounting. If you buy something inside of this, you're creating a debit and a credit. And what accountants do is they want to see that transaction recorded in two places. The next thing is that a double entry system involves the, the, involve recording the effects of each um, transaction as debits and credits. Now back to this one, and we'll put this up here. The other link that's absolutely always unbreakable is the left hand of the account is the debit side and the right hand side of the, is the credit side. So think of your bank statements. How many of you read your bank statements regularly? My word, it's 15%. Austerity is still with us, isn't it, ladies and gentlemen? I tend to open mind less as well. It's the same with your bank statements. Debits paid in on the left, credits paid, up, paid in on the right. Um, if you struggle with this, Think ACDC. I don't know whether ACDC conjures... Well, I mean, we could have a long morning if we conjured up all the things that it might conjure up. But um, a power supply, or it may be an Australian rock band. 
with a guitarist who wears short trousers. I don't know what that brings up for you, but think ACDC, which is every account, debit left, credit right. So you can't go wrong when you're thinking about how to enter these things. And finally, and probably most importantly, is all of that starts to go up to make up. Remember, every transaction, just think of a business, every transaction is recording it in two places. Um, that goes, in, it goes into actually giving an account against this equation, the accounting equation, which is assets equals liabilities plus capital. What we have is equal to what we owe. So a company has to give a, particularly a listed company, has to give a public account of itself for the extent to which it is a viable enterprise, a going concern, that it can meet its liabilities at any particular given point in time. Um, and if you're struggling with this, it shouldn't be too hard, because I don't know any of you, I mean, some of you must have done a, some of you must have done a home renovation, or you, I don't know how, how geeky you are about managing your personal finances, or you, you know, kind of plan them very carefully. But whenever we start to do a budget, we tend to immediately do what's called a T account. So from time immemorial, we tend to put a page, a line down the page. And what accountancy is all about is recording that debit and that credit on the left-hand side and the right-hand side. Coming back to where I started about how to read a balance sheet, what's really, really helpful is that actually that structure, in terms of the way accounts are reported, tends to follow then the accounting equation, in that you tend to see the accounting equation, assets equals liabilities plus capital, replicated in the way in which we look at balance sheets. Now remember what I've just said about a balance sheet. A balance sheet is, all it does is that accounting occasion, what we have is equal to what we owe. It gives a public account of that at a particular point in time. We tend to work to a financial end year point. The key point, of course, is it has to balance. Hmm. Understandably. The value of the assets must be equal to the claims made against those assets, its liabilities. And what you'll find, and test it, go and get a few, download a few company reports from listed companies, what you'll find is that in the way in which most balance sheets, not all, but most balance sheets then report their assets and liabilities, they tend to follow the same structure in terms of how they place them. Even if they don't, the key thing to remember is when you're looking at a balance sheet, if you're looking at your own team, your own finances, your own budget, think all the time around what are our liabilities, what are our contingencies, are we confident that the revenue flow, our assets, are going to meet those liabilities. If you do that, you're halfway towards understanding the basic fundamentals of financial accounting. That's cash. Okay. Well, now I'm going to talk you through um, conversation. Um, for those of you that have... Um, any market, who's here for marketing? Okay, a few of you. Um, this is our marketing module. Um, but we think marketing is better thought of now as um, conversation. Um, why? Um, well, we want to make a very clear pitch to you, which is that... Products, companies, markets, and the communities that sustain all of those things are now built on conversation. They're built on exchange. They're built on co-production. Um, and I'm going to make a case to you as to why that's happened. Um, and what it's done, that movement to conversation, is that it's changing the way in which we create value. Why conversation is a term, Theodore Zeldin, who's a fantastic philosopher, has this wonderful phrase. And which is the great thing about conversation is it doesn't really shuffle cards, it creates new cards. So the act of exchange, you probably know this, if you look at the debate now about innovation and the way in which companies come up with new ideas, the idea of someone, a great thinker in your business, being stuck in a lonely garret or in a scientific institution as the way in which you come up with answers has gone forever. Actually scientifically proven now, fantastically interesting research, mm -hmm. that actually crowdsourcing an answer mm -hmm. from a diverse and interdisciplinary group of people will get you a better answer. So there's actually scientific, lots of academics in America are looking at, and this is from scientific questions to questions around the business. If you ask that question of a community, and you as your company will be able to define the communities that matter to you, and to a wide range of expertise, you end up with a better answer than if you ask it of a narrow expert community inside your business. So what we're seeing is a big shift. What it means for marketing, though, as well, is that it's this shift in a general trend about what's, a, what's called a one-to-one -to, -one to a one-to-many world. So if that's the bigger shift around, if you like, that kind of notion of how we get ideas, collaborative capitalism, if you like, um, the big shift for marketing, of course, is that the world's changed. Um, in the old days, um, you used to be able to broadcast. Um, but as a consequence, and that's changing, but what's happening, therefore, amidst those changes, that the four Ps, who remembers Kotler? Who remembers Kotler who did the, you know, the Bible? Okay. So the four Ps, product, place, promotion, price, are being overtaken by the four Cs. Um, which is conversation, customization, community, and co-creation. 
Um, we do this all the time ourselves now. So we don't expect one product, one size, one colour. We expect to be able to personalise, customise, be engaged in a dialogue with our product or service provider. Crucially, communities. Increasingly, we don't work together on our own. We collaborate. We go to our community groups that interest us. We go to people who've got similar issues and find who's writing or blogging about the product or the service or the issue or the campaign or the idea that we care about. Um, and we're all intimately interested in, in also increasingly being invited to create things ourselves um, with products and services. Um, the impact for companies is this. The problem is, is that if you stick in an old model of send and not receive, of broadcast and not conversation, the danger is no one's going to listen to you. So this is the shift from the one-to-one -to, -one to the one-to-many world. It's the simplest example of this is how many of you have got a Sky Plus box or a Virgin Media box or a... OK, great. And so that, therefore, how many of you are regularly time-shifting your media consumption and entertainment consumption and not watching at the time it aired? Excellent. And how many of you are now watching TV adverts regularly during the course of your week? Not many. So as a, they're still important, but, the, but as a dom this ocean of the old marketing, which was interrupting you, with a fantastic 30-second piece of broadcast content, has shifted profoundly to where now the new marketing is how do you engage the interest of communities, capture their scarce attention, and pull them towards you? It's a bit like the social media debate. I love this debate. Two or three years ago when we started this, there was a debate about should, we have a, should a company have a social media strategy? I still, I'm sorry if this is going to offend anyone, I still laugh now when I discover companies are still having that conversation. Your consumers have decided that you need one. If you still think you've got a choice about whether you need a social media strategy, you're frankly not walking outside your building very often um, or working out what's happening in terms of how people communicate with each other um, because that has already shifted profoundly. Um, and the other way that this also therefore starts to change the way in which you face your market, the way in which you have to communicate with it, is that, and I like this very much, David Rogers' work, David Rogers has written, The Network is Your Customer, is that increasingly also, not only have we risen, gone from the one to, many, one to one to one to many world, this messy exchange, all of us, Tab Scott has this fantastic phrase, which is um, weapons of mass collaboration. Tablets and smartphones and computers and the internet give everyone weapons of mass collaboration. We all have got the chance to write, blog, produce, share, um, it's not just the privilege now of broadcasters or companies with lots of resources. Is what that also means, increasingly, you can't also therefore now have that conversation with an individual, sometimes you will. You're increasingly talking to communities. You're increasingly trying to move and influence the ambassadors, content creators, champions of particular communities. Mumsnet, I'm sure you know this, hugely important community. Um, so PepsiCo, anyone here from Pepsi? I, did, I, I didn't see it on this, I think they are. So PepsiCo are very open and honest in their public statements that actually they test ideas around new flavours and products in Mumsnet. So, you know, you would immediately think in that community, in that network, how do I start to... And, of course, if you start to engage them in a conversation, you come up with a fantastic new sugar-free product or something. Of course, then, the whole point about this is what's changed on this marketing funnel. So you'll know that marketing is all about moving people from awareness to consideration to action. Of course, is that it's created a loop, which is advocacy at the bottom. Because actually, unless you're getting your customers to talk about what you do and be advocates for it, then you're not even beginning to complete the loop on that conversation to grow your products and services. So this is very profound um, in terms of what it means for the way in which all parts of a business have to be open, collaborative, and facing outwards. But of course, none of that means that marketeers, therefore, have given up. I mean, actually, some of them are having an existential crisis, but we can explore that later over coffee. Um, they're going to have to find new ways to speak to businesses, which seems an appropriate moment for the uh, language module. How do you know he's having an existential crisis? No, I, well, I, said, okay, I, I didn't tell. say him. I said some might be. Did I say, you are, though. Did I say you were? I'm sorry. I meant some might be. Um, it looks like you. Uh, right. Uh, it's an international MBA. We've decided to make it international. Um, just to super double it. Who speaks Mandarin? Anyone speak Mandarin? Thank, thank God for that. Okay. Uh, you are going to shortly. Um, we don't have much time. Obviously, we'd like to do a whole year um, to get you up to a different fluency level, but we don't, we've only got about a minute. Um, uh, who knows what that says? No, me neither. Okay. Uh, so, this is the, and then you get the kind of phonetic version underneath it in the dictionary. Look, that doesn't help me anymore. I can't, I can't read that any more than I can read that. So, I've done my own version here, right? Ni hoi sho ing wen ma. Ni hoi sho ing wen ma. I want you to try it, okay? After three, one, two, three. Ni hoi sho ing wen ma. Really, really sing. It's a very melodic language, very sing song. Ni hoi sho ing wen ma. So lots of, have another go. Ni hoi sho ing wen ma. 
You're being very British about it, if you don't mind me saying. You're going, knee hoi shaw ing wen ma, okay? Knee hoi shaw ing wen ma. Well, that do. Can I go now? I'm going to pick on you in a minute. I heard you saying, if I sit in the front row, he'll pick on me. Go on, you try it. <laughs> <laughs> You're in the second row, I'm still picking on you. Knee hoi shaw ing wen ma. That was much that was better, wasn't it? Good. Give a round of applause, right? He's better. Knee hoi shaw ing wen ma. Now, one more time, together. Ni hoi shaw ing wen ma. That's it, smile. One more time. Ni hoi shaw ing wen ma. Very good. Why have I taught you that? Because that is Mandarin for do you speak English? <laughs> if you don't understand the answer, move on. Find someone who does and sell your idea to them. Okay, sorry, that's the foreign language. And just, and just on that, look, I'm good. I, 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 Thing is, I, I've done, I did this last, uh, last year and I offended a bit. Have we got any tiger mothers in the audience who are getting their children to learn Mandarin? Thank heavens. I'm a tiger um, dad in that case. Are you? Yeah, well, you see, I'm, well, I haven't, I haven't caught him up with this. Yeah. I, I've been watching this and then I looked at the figures for the rate of English language acquisition in China. Yeah. And then I looked at the strengths of the Chinese economy, which, by the way, are not lateral thinking, creativity, philosophy, right. the ability to have a disruptive idea, to think differently. So to me, it seems rather strange that you would devote your resources to make sure that your children can speak a language, which, by the way, with advantage of Google technology, automatic <laughs> translation tools, is irrelevant. Rather than encouraging your children to be creative thinkers, lateral, take them, to, take them to art galleries, make them draw, do philosophy, do the things that might actually make a tangible difference, not only to their productivity and creativity, which the Chinese society will continue to struggle with, rather than a language that will be irrelevant for them to know in terms of their added value in about 10 years' time, just in case anyone's thinking of investing you just in just critique my whole thing. Are, um, are we now going to sort of critique? It's, well, no, I, <laughs> it's, I just taught them to speak Chinese. It's, well, the great thing, the great joy about public because you get the old pulpit moment. So I just grabbed a pulpit <laughs> moment. You don't have to agree. OK, back to, back to, um, back to conversation. So I'm painting this picture of this rise of this many-to-many -many collaborative world. I'm going to do a bit more just to convince you about the scale to which this is happening. Um, Wikipedia is a very good example of something which I like to think about. So if you like, this is the democratisation of the production and consumption of everything. Or another way of thinking about it, this is the era of mass innovation. So we're starting to build platforms, tools, invitations to communities that allow them to create value in ways they didn't do before. And if your company isn't thinking that's what its business is, Whatever it does, it's going to struggle. So Wikipedia is a good start place. So why Wikipedia? Well, of course, this is not an anti-BBC licence point, by the way, as it goes through debates about charter renewal. Um, but Wikipedia generates more web traffic in the UK per day through its site than the BBC online service. Um, do you know how many employees, on its last reported account of number of employees it has, Wikipedia reported as having in 2012, which is the last figure I can find? Anyone want to guess? Very good guess. It was 45. Um, so um, this is a classic example of user-generated content. Now, of course, we can now talk about wiki errors, and we could talk about how it gets corrupted, and that it's not necessarily a, a valid or credible source of information at all points. But what it shows is, if you have a compelling purpose, which was the democratisation of knowledge, the idea that actually it would be good if there was a platform for engaged experts to um, be able to create knowledge about things and have it in a real-time, transparent editing environment, always beta, always changing, always adapting, wouldn't that be a good thing? Um, what that then means you've got to think about, and again, I don't know where you sit on social media, where your company is, whether you're good at this, embracing it fully, doing it slowly, but again, I don't, don't, caught up with, don't get caught up with the tech. Um, what this really is about is just seeing it as conversational media, seeing, asking yourself, are we a collaborative company? Are we conversational? Do we open ourselves up to our customers and suppliers? And do we collaboratively create knowledge and value? A couple of examples, ARM Holdings. I live in Cambridge, and Arm are quite near, and they make all the chips for our mobile phones. You've probably heard of them. If you, if you haven't, they're one of the UK's most successful companies. Um, and I went to see them, because they're obviously doing very well. And what I discovered, and I went to speak to a guy called Bill Parsons, who's their vice principal for um, human resource management. Wait for it. They have 600 network partners. Now, that means individuals or businesses that they're in conversation with, networking with. By the way, these are not partners that they have a transactional business relationship with. These are partners that they think are interesting, that might be able to help them to do things, um, to have new ideas. Um, if you're, anyone here is a talent manager, it means that if you're a head of talent inside a business, you should be thinking just as much as the talent outside in your networks, as opposed to the talent inside your business when you're trying to come up with a new idea. Um, so it, what you should actually see these things are as platforms for a conversation. Interestingly, let's also look at what it might mean for how you think about your employees. Fascinating. Um, mm. Clout. Clout is a tool that allows you to measure the um, social network influence of your employees. It's not just about their 
size of their Twitter following. It's about actually, are they influential, both in terms of your enterprise networks and outside? Microsoft, who bought Clout, have just connected that piece of kit to their Yammer. Anyone heard of Yammer, your internal? If some of you have got that, excellent. So some of you may not. If you haven't got an internal um, platform to encourage knowledge exchange and sharing in your business, you're probably going to be out of business in five years' time, I'd suggest. Um, they've connected Clout to their Yammer so that they can actively measure the extent to which employees are having influence in terms of their sharing and collaboration inside their businesses. This is coming to an organisation near you very soon. We could also talk about social performance management, which is real-time tools that allow people to get 360 feedback through their social media profile. But anyway, um, that's the, so the, when I therefore talk about how marketing isn't marketing anymore, it's conversation, in the same way product development anymore isn't product development, it's conversation, in the same way that your brand isn't your brand anymore because someone else owns the conversation about it. And here's the example why. Um, the interesting thing about public is they can both be friend and foe. They can be helpful and unhelpful. Um, here's an example of foes. Um, the uncut movement. You could honestly say, I think, that a spontaneous, public, social media-led, conversational campaign has been the most uh, effective form of opposition um, to a piece of corporate practice in this country since the election in 2010. Um, because it brought heat, transparency, sunlight to a set of corporate tax practices to a whole range of businesses that has not, was not led by a politician, was not led by an expert, but absolutely gained currency because of the power of us, back to many to many, the public, to own a conversation about the practices of others. Remember, it's not your conversation anymore, it's the consumer's conversation. If you think you own your conversation about your brand, you don't. We could leave you lots of other examples. Um, PayPal sucks, the HSBC graduate rip of campaign. You don't have to look very far to see that apps all the time the public are rising up and can be your foes. But the important thing for corporates, of course, is if this happens to you, the one thing you can't adore, do is ignore it. What you have to do is either try and get them to speak less loudly or to speak about something else. But if you think the, the right response to any type of this is to ignore, hopeless. Um, remember, it's a conversation. Um, similarly, if you, if you have a problem in your business resilience or continuity, um, we all know the fate of BlackBerry. You know, we knew, I knew BlackBerry was finished when they had that, like, that service breakdown and said nothing for three days. I mean, it's almost like a business being run by small children. I mean, anyone who, who would do that doesn't understand the way modern capitalism works or the way modern conversations run about your brand in real time. Um, here's another one that's nice. Also, they can be friend and foe. I looked at the attendance list who's coming. I'm not going to say which business this is. This is one of you. Anyone heard of Glassdoor? Who's heard of Glassdoor? Good. About 5% of you. Go and look on Glassdoor. It's fascinating, particularly for a HR director. So, a couple of, so, so this was on, on Monday. I, I looked at who was coming. I picked a business. 59% um, of your employees would recommend this company to a friend and that you've worked there. Pros, free coffee, pleasant colleagues. We've talked about the importance of sociability. Um, cons, an aggressive management street. I don't know. Remember, of course, that if you're a HR director, some of the people motivated to go on this might have a bias to report negativity. Um, it would, there's a lot of white noise in it. Actually, there's also other things I don't have time to do here, which is that they give tips to senior management. So they also think things that need to be improved. From my not rigorous content analysis of that stuff. I'd say the big tips that they tend to give, it's always about process. Too much process, not enough speed, not enough agility. If I could say one thing about, and probably some dissatisfaction about transparent reward cultures. I mean, you have a look. But if you go across all kinds of businesses, the things that tend to come up most is, can we be quicker? Why do we slow ourselves down? Why do we get in our way of ourselves? And that's often a debate about management layers or process. But here's friend and foe. So again, a really good example about how this is inevitably conversational and inevitably something that you have to be taking clear on. Let's also look at the positive side. This is Alvin Toffler. Alvin Toffler's one of the few futurists who got anything right. We're not great fans of futurology. No. Most of it is based on the fear principle. You know, they're going to sell you something that makes you scared and then it never arrives. Um, but he came up 30 years ago with the rise of the prosumer, the producing consumer. He predicted this co-production many-to-many world. Who knows what this is? This is a <laughs> quick example. Who knows what this is? It wasn't, uh, you, don't worry, you weren't the demographic. It wasn't aimed at you. Um, this is a Lego Mindstorm robot, which was aimed at um, young teenage boys, really, in the main, sort of 12, 13, 14. Um, when Lego launched it, it was a, by the way, it's a part of the story of their turnaround. When Lego launched it, they discovered that the real target market for this, in fact, wasn't young teenage boys. Um, it was adult hobbyists. I know, ladies and gentlemen, it's a phrase to conjure with, isn't it? Um, long hair, lank, slogan T-shirt, head inside a computer, uninteresting data uninteresting profile on a dating site near you. Remember, they are adult hobbyists. Anyway, when this came out, they, they grabbed it, they took it apart, they worked out how to reprogram it, they picked it up, they went running back to mummy, I mean Lego, and they said, look what we've done. Um, and Lego initially um, thought about suing them. Hmm. 
because they'd actually infringed their copyright and IP, and they were starting to publicise the changes and do community blogging about how to improve their product. Of course, Lego very sensibly recognised that wasn't a very eloquent response to that opening conversational pitch from that very important group of ambassadors and champions for their brand, and they built in a licence to hack, and of course now those lovely adult hobbyists have helped build brand value and product innovation for Lego and helped to turn around their business. A very, very good example of conversation. So if you're not facing your consumers, your suppliers, in ways in which you feel you're staging a collaborative conversation with them, I suggest you might not face a particularly secure future in whatever business you're in and you should think about changing it. Um, so therefore, as I mentioned, not the people here who are brilliant on top, you know, leading edge marketeers, but some marketeers are facing some crisis around this. That doesn't mean they're giving up because they're very canny. And I'm going to tell you how they're responding to the difficulty of this, to new ruses to understand how we think and feel about products and brands. Richard. So uh, I hope you're giving me some phrases to conjure with as well. Impress your colleagues with, you know, prosumer or commitment dividend and stuff. Here's another one, neuromarketing. Um, uh, people seem to be now willing to get into MRI scanners or even wear MRI scanners while they're doing pretty much everything. Um, I don't know if you've seen all these studies, but it's fantastic. They're looking inside your brain, uh, mostly California. There's some, cu some couples have been willing to be in a massive MRI scanner while they make love. Uh, and they can see what's happening in the brain, and then they write it up. This is science, apparently. Um, but this is about how people's brains light up when they buy things, or think about buying things, right? So neuromarketing is quite a good phrase to come to. Here's this is a picture of the brain. Any neuroscientists in the room? Anyone got O-level biology? <laughs> <laughs> Great, we're all in about the same place then. Um, so uh, this is from a pr pr proper study, right? Uh, from Neuron, that sounds important. Uh, and what they looked at was people drinking Coke and what happened in their brains as they drank the Coke, right? And what's happening here is the kind of pleasure bit of the brain uh, is lighting up. So, oh, yes, it's nice, etc. One bit lighting up a bit more than others. And they, were, they didn't know which one they were doing. Two well-known brands, Pepsi and Coca-Cola, were in this. But they didn't know. They were blind to which one it was. They were kind of tasting them. It's kind of turned out they slightly, on this measure, only preferred Pepsi without knowing what it was, rather than Coke, according to their brains, according to the pleasure bits of their brains. Right? And then what they did was they told them what it was. And then different bits of the brain light up. And these are the bits of the brain that are memory, right? The amygdala, or I, I don't know, um, or the prefrontal cortex, whatever. Anyway, memory, the bit that helps you remember stuff. And then once they knew what they were drinking, a different bit of the brain lit up. A different bit of the brain lights up because they have an association with it. You kind of remember, it. oh, this is Coca Cola. Right, you kind of drink, I know what I'm drinking now. It triggers the memory bit of their brain. But here was the interesting thing the pleasure bit of their brain also then lit up more as well. So what the study tells us is that it's not that people think they like Coke more than Pepsi. People do like Coke more than Pepsi when they know it's Coke. Because it's such a strong brand association, has such strong memories with them, that actually the memory bit lights up, which makes the pleasure bit light up. If they don't know what it is, they prefer Pepsi. Once they know what it is, they prefer Coke. They don't think they like it more, they actually do like it more. Now that's brand value. Right? That's what you want. You want people to kind of have such an association that actually, they actually, once they know it's you, oh yeah, I love Starbucks coffee, or, or whatever it is. Uh, and stick someone in an MRI scanner, it's fun. Come on. Um, and just a funny thing on that is, I'm, I'm now, um, oh, I'll well, come clean, I'm, a, I'm a 18 months away from being 50. And the interesting thing about these kinds of experiments is I never used to have that keen an attitude to students. Um, but now I realise that actually students are the only thing standing between me and a longer life, you know, because of their willingness to subject themselves to having their head stuck in MRI scanners and pets yeah, and said through a tube. Um, you know, we can no longer experiment on animals quite correctly, so you no longer see pictures of smoking beagles, but we seem to be able to subject students to all manner of, of discomfort, <laughs> and all for, the, all for the benefit of my future longevity and health. So, frankly, let's hear it for students, because other without them, mm -hmm. um, you know, my life would be looking less well, you know, beneficial than this. Um, you can see we've got two minutes left. How do you do a summary of a summary? We're on to the summary part. Well, you can't really. Um, but we're going to show how to do that in about 40 seconds. What we can say, though, is, um, and I hope we prove it to you, is we do fervently believe um, that you can do express erudition, that you can summarise um, some of the best nuggets that you would genuinely get on an MBA course. Um, it is worth telling you, as Richard said, that we had some bad reaction at the beginning, but interestingly, from the corporate world, we had a different reaction than the academic world. The academic world said, how can you possibly dare do this in 80 minutes? Um, of course, the corporate world said, can you do it a bit quicker? <laughs> so we very quickly got asked to do, to do the 30-minute MBA. We've even done that. That was very good, by the way, the 30-minute, if you're thinking of getting us in for a quick session. The 12 minutes suffered quite a bit, I'd yeah. say. That wasn't quite good. <laughs> so, and I sense for some of you it dragged, so I apologise it wasn't quick enough for you. Um, but um, I'm going to pass to Richard, who is going to summarise in his own unique way the 80-minute MBA. We can do it in verse, like Kipling, with apologies to if. Kipling. If you can save the world while all about you are looking just at the bottom line, 
If you factor the planet into everything you do and know the weather outlook is anything but fine. If you know you are weak as well as strong, but know where you're headed on the map. What shape you're in and who to take along and that books on leadership are mostly crap. If you see work as a shared adventure and skip to the office at a time that suits you, you know people in firms with funny names like Accenture. That you've pla- replaced all your meeting biscuits with vitalising fruits. If you've now got accounting down to that simple T, you know statistics are largely managed luck. If ACDC is now to you ABC, and your reflex to a balance sheet is no longer as mine was, oh fuck. <laughs> if you can detect the voices of your prosumers and hear more than just blah, blah, blah. Wiki conversations, then, will profitably consume us if you've remembered to say, ni hoi sho ing wen ma. If all of this you duly follow, if you've a resolve that doesn't bend, you'll be ready for tomorrow. And what is more, as of now, you're now an MBA, my friend. <laughs> <laughs>